this might just be the best chess game I've ever witnessed. It's definitely the best game we've seen this year, and it happened out of the recently concluded European Team Chess Championship, and the game is between Nicholas Theodoru and Timur Rajabov, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And the game is just insane, because White played with an accuracy of 100%. I'll show you at the end. So first off, White starts with e4, e5, knight of three, knight of six. This is a basic Petrov's defense. And then bishop c5. He's aiming at the f2 square, so if White doesn't do anything, there will be a fork. However, there this uh, White plays a really nice line that, that gambits the fork bishop c4 and most people would probably play bishop e3 but getting your pawns doubled straight out of the opening without your kings getting castled is probably not the best idea so bishop c4 this is all basically theory and then knight takes f2 you might think well now white's definitely just gone right he just he just gave up the fork but not really because white has the insane sacrifice bishop takes f7 that's the first brilliant move in this game. And the point is, if the king doesn't take, well, then you have queen d2. You give up the rook, but now queen f4, and things get a little dicey. Stockfish may evaluate this as equal, but when your opponent's up five points of material and stockfish evaluates as equal you know that you have a loss of compensation in this case the compensation is a big attack so anyway going back to the game bishop takes f7 obviously the most natural move is to take the bishop which is what happened in the game but now white can play queen d5 check king g6 and what you might think here is the point was to sacrifice the bishop was to get out of the fork. And so you can move your rook to f1, attack this knight, and then the king is out in the open, you go attack. But that's not what white does, because that's losing too much of your attack. You you don't want to let this knight get back and retreat to the king, because you don't want to give black any time. Because what black wants to do is go h6 and hide his king and be safe and be up lots of material. So white plays the next brilliant move, queen takes c5. He gives up the rook in exchange for the bishop. But do remember that he did sacrifice his bishop on f7, so it's really risky. You have to calculate it really well. The point of this is to make this knight sort of an outcast, and now you can lead this attack on the king. And white does exactly that with knight c3. He's going to go for knight d5, and some knight takes d7 stuff in the future. So, h6, exactly what black wants to do. He just wants to hide his king. Knight d5, the knight jumps in the middle. Ideas of knight e7, which will be really dangerous, and knight takes e7. Rook e8, and you might think, doesn't this give up the c7 pawn? It does, and that also comes with the fork. And the point of rook e8 was obviously to protect the e7 square, but what you can't take on c7 is because d6 and there's a lot of dicey lines because you can't take because the rook pins your queen moves back and now you can go d5 again if you take with the knight you've lost your fork and well it's just not going to be really pleasant for white and then if you move your queen back up knight a6 comes and now you can't take either rooks because your queen is under attack if you trade your attacks over and if you go back then d4 and another attack if you take here then you gambit this if you take like this then you give up this and it's just not what white wants to do right now so instead of that white goes with the safer and more attacking approach queen d4 the idea is to obviously rotate at queen g4 and then he's going to get his knight in, or whatever the point is to just continue the attack you don't want to focus on the wrong side of the board because if you go knight takes e7, you're focusing on the queen side when you want to be focusing on this king. So the king retreats to h7, the entire idea of h6. And then we have the brilliant move, bishop takes h6. You don't want to let black get any chances of escaping with the king. So you immediately just break his shelter. You uh, just capture the only pawn that's really protecting black at the expense of a bishop. This is a really nice move. 
Um, Stockfish obviously evaluates this as equal the entire game, but believe me, it's far from equal. White's way better. So what happened in the game, he took with the pawn. So I'm just going to show you what happens if he takes with the king. There's this really nice line, queen e3, or, and then king h7. Stockfish did hesitate for a moment because Stockfish doesn't really know how to evaluate this position. It thinks that black's winning and then white's winning and then it's equal. But let me tell you this, a white's winning. And then there's knight g5. And then you can just get really good. Queen f4 threatening. Queen f7 check. Almost mate. Rook f8. Queen h4. That's unstoppable checkmate. You have to give up your queen. So you can't really take with the king. So instead, black takes with the pawn. But this still is completely losing. Even though Stockfish obviously values this as equal. And now you can't play knight f6 here. Because if you play knight f6, the queen just takes. And you can't take the queen because of the pin. So instead, white plays a very tough move to find. It's like not brilliant. But in all the midst of this, you wouldn't think of playing this. He plays ca castles. Long castles. A really, really weird move. But then you realize why he played long castles. Your rook really wants to get in this game, and there's now a lot of uh, pressure on black because now the your king's out of the middle. The rook's attacking the knight. The knight has nowhere to move, and knight of six is a big threat. And so is queen e4 and all this other stuff. All of this just by the simple moves long castle. It's a really beautiful game, and it really teaches you a lot of how to be patient. You know, you really shouldn't always go with this attack. You just see. Could I make my position a bit better? It's not always about material, you know. So he long castles to get his rook in the game, to get his king out of the middle, and to continue his attack. And now, black has options. He can play knight c6, but then again, queen e4 check. Black does blunder here. He plays rook e6. Um, I, I can't really say for sure what the idea of rook e6 um, it could have been to meet knight f6 by sacrificing the rook, or it could have been to just rotate the rook over here. But then again, why wouldn't you do it here? Pops probably because the king wouldn't have enough room. Now the queen can go here, the rook can go here. Okay, okay, we see the idea. Now, um, why obviously plays knight f6. So what happened in the game is was king h8. I'm going to show you what another line, which is sacrificing the rook. Because the point is, you're already up material. Sacrificing your rook isn't going to be that bad for a knight, at least. But the thing is, now there's some pressure. You have a passed pawn. Your rook is attacking this knight once again. Now this knight has even more freedom because the, the e5 square is cleared up for attacks. And if you just play something like knight c6, then queen e4, and then queen g6, and it's basically checkmate. So, you maybe shouldn't sacrifice the rook here. So, black plays king h8, which is the second best move. King h8 was what happened in the game. White plays knight h4. The point is to obviously occupy g6 or maybe even f5. In response, black goes a d6, but this does nothing because queen f4 now, he doesn't rush with knight g6. Because he wants to get all his pieces to the king before he gives any chance for the black king to move. So he goes queen f4. He's threatening the h6 pawn. He's threatening the knight again. He could get his rook here. He could move his knight back and, you know, go to the seventh rank with his queen. There's a lot of stuff. And it's basically checkmate, according to Stockfish. And now what happens in the game was king g7. Black's desperately trying to escape, but this really does nothing. All it does is move your king up closer. And now queen g4 check. King retreats back to h8. Knight g6. King g7. And the final brilliant move, the fourth brilliant move of this game, knight f8 check. It's brilliant because you wouldn't think of it. Because you'd think, oh, well, the king just takes. But the problem with the king taking is that queen g8. King e7. Queen g7 is checkmate because you have a lot of options. You can go king f7. But that's not really good. You can go queen g6, but there's an even faster checkmate with queen g8. King g7. 
knight g6 checkmate. The other line was to go back to h8, but this is pretty obvious. Queen g8, checkmate. Lastly, I want to show you a really interesting piece of information throughout the game. I want you to look at the time usage over here because I think that's really fascinating. Just look at the time. Look at the time white spends in this game compared to black. He's blitzing out all of his moves in a 90 minute game. Look, in this point of the game, white has an hour and 30. You know how much he started out with? He started with an hour and 30, and now he has an hour and 28. And his opponent is actually taking his time. He has around 28 minutes here, and his, and White just has an hour and 28, and he managed to play at a 100% accuracy, which is crazy. By the end of the game, 29 and 14 seconds. One hour and 28 minutes 54 seconds left on the clock for white which is wild because he basically just spent like a minute and six seconds playing this entire game obviously there was added time each move you make his opponent took time this man was playing blitz in a classical game and still managed let me show you here he still managed to pull off a 100 percent accuracy if i go here to full screen he still managed to get 100% accuracy, even though he spent literally one minute and six seconds on his clock. This guy is absolutely insane.